forge this relationship because Bastiat was in the same sort of neighborhood circle that Warhol hung out in, which was the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Basquiat decided to go in and interrupt Warhol's lunch one day and sell him one of his paintings, not give him one, but he decided to ask him if he wanted to purchase one. And I think that that was really unusual because people were probably always trying to push themselves onto Warhol and into his circle, but to ask him to buy something was kind of nervy. And he was interested, he, it piqued his interest, and he wound up kind of being in the same circles. Um, but you can see their images are very con and contrasting. Given their individual commercial success and critical acclaim, their collaboration was certainly a fruitful one. Basquiat was greatly affected by Warhol's eventual death, and Basquiat died the uh, following year, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. It was a sort of a crazy art world marriage, and they were an odd couple. In some ways, Jean-Michel thought that he needed Andy's fame, and Andy thought that he needed Jean-Michel's new ideas. Jean-Michel gave Andy a rebellious image again. In fall of 83, Jean-Michel rented a loft at a property that Andy owned, creating a proximity which led to a close friendship and many talks of collaboration between the two. And this is an example of one of the collaborations in the back. This was Andy Warhol's um, screen printing technique. It's a major logo. And then right smack on top of it is uh, Basquiat's graffiti. He had like this childlike graffiti, heavy on symbols, as you can see here. And so it was just disrupted. It's art interrupted. We're going to shift gears just a little bit, but as I said earlier, we're going to believe me, it's going to all circle up. This is Madonna in her first apartment in Manhattan. She was bold enough to come to New York City after she dropped out of the University of Michigan on a dance scholarship. So Madonna was actually a dancer and a pretty talented dancer. Uh, in 1977, uh, she escaped her very Catholic religious upbringing and she, with $35 in her pocket, she took a bus from Michigan to New York City. She got a job at Dunkin' Donuts and supported herself with various side gigs like working as a coat check girl at the danceteria. And she um, hung out with the uh, underground dance clubs and a diver diverse group of gay friends who ushered her into the city's you know, artistic and sexualized atmosphere. Very different than the way she was um, brought up. Madonna lost her mother uh, at the age of 30, when the mother was 30, from breast cancer. And she was never told that her mother was sick. So when she eventually died, it was very painful for Madonna. And then as Madonna got older, she sort of, and this is natural, you know, for a young person, sort of lost a lot of memories of her mother, you know, as she gets older. And I think that that was very painful for Madonna to, to lose some of these valuable memories, like for instance, what her mother's voice sounded like and what her mother, you know, in some ways looked like. Uh, of course, pictures helped, but, it was, it was hard on her, it was very hard on her. Madonna's father wound up marrying the housekeeper and they had two other children, which is an interesting side note, and just to draw parallels. And um, Madonna never quite accepted that union, you know, she, especially as a young person, she felt sort of betrayed, especially because it was a woman that she knew as the housekeeper. This is where Madonna lives. That's one of her early, it is her first apartment in, in New York. Nothing glamorous. And um, Madonna and Basquiat had dated for a little while. Handsome and unapologetic, fearless, Jean-Michel flirted with Madonna. He introduced her to the highest artistic circles of the time. And Madonna became his new postmodern muse. Fashion designers, artists, and other musicians gravitated toward her. Um, Basquiat, uh, excuse me, uh, gravitated toward, towards her, the future queen of pop. By the by, then Basquiat was living in a loft in the Lower East Side, rented from Andy Warhol. His place was covered with his work, and his clothes were scattered everywhere. Um, interesting side note: a man by the last uh, Paul Gauguin, who is a gallery owner and a British art collector had asked Basquiat to come to California 
and he did, and he asked if Madonna could come, um, and it was okay, it was allowed. And uh, right away, this man knew that Madonna was going to be something because she just had this energy about her. So um, she she wound up just staying for a little while in California, but she was really quite the force, from what I understand. They did wind up breaking up, and. Basquiat had gifted Madonna several of his paintings with this graffiti, rough, childlike imagery. And when they had broken up, because Madonna was fed up with the heroin use and then, you know, the nonstop infidelities, uh, then he painted those paintings black and he refused to, you know, talk to her again. Um, Madonna did love Basquiat, but trust, monogamy, and devotion wavered under the pressures of a severe heroin addiction. Madonna was just a step away from reaching stardom. A close friend named DJ Jelly Bean Benitez played her music in some of these underground clubs throughout New York City. And in the second year of their relationship, she released her album. Her first album was titled Madonna, which launched her career as one of the most influential pop figures in music. Um, enter Keith Haring. Keith Haring was uh, from Cutstown, Pennsylvania, and he came to New York in 1978. You can see that New York is becoming quite the magnet. And um, side note, Warhol is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so they have that connection. And Warhol's original last name was Warhalla, which he thought sounded too Polish. His parents were Polish immigrants, so he decided to change it to Warhol. And um, Keith Haring, came to study at the School of Visual Arts, and he formed a close group of friends that thrived in the chaos of the city. The group consisted of graffiti artists, musicians, and performance artists who frequented counterculture hangouts. Keith organized art shows, and he would perform at Club 57, showcasing his own videotapes, poetry, and dancing. Um, he, was, he landed in the city at basically the, the height of the sexual revolution, and he was a homosexual, although he was very open with his sexuality to his friends and his circle. He was always closed with, with his family because his family was very religious. And um, in this particular piece, what he is doing is uh, he is taking chalk and creating figures that have no details and no facial features, cartoonish, um, on top of these blacked out advertising advertisements in the subway. So this would never happen today in 2019, but it did happen frequently in the 80s. And I can attest to that, I remember these. Um, this, when a, an advertising was in purchase for a month, <coughs> These were several months, these were just painted black. It was just an opportunity to put, you know, billboard, you know, posters up. Uh, but but uh, Keith Haring chose to use chalk because he felt like at first he wouldn't be in trouble for that because it was temporary. And he created these figures, and what he did was they were mostly very, very positive, and they were saying, sending a message without using text. And a lot of times they would have these like radiating lines, as you can see, to show energy, to show movement. So here you go. It's a piece of money on fire. Someone's touching it, and people are reaching for it. Eventually, he did move into spray paint, and he became very popular. He had a, uh, a following. And he, there's another artist that's still alive. His name is Phil Frost who had a very similar, um, similar type style. And sometimes the Keith Haring Foundation are burdened with the task of trying to uh, authenticate some of this uh, artwork that is discovered you know, 30 years later. Uh, but here's a picture of Keith Haring with Basquiat because they traveled in the same circles. Here is an excerpt from a uh, a uh, interview done in Rolling Stones magazine. Um, the question that the interviewer asked Keith Haring was, was this the period in which Basquiat was doing his early graffiti? Yeah, but the stuff I saw on the walls was more poetry than graffiti. They were sort of philosophical poems that would use the language the way William S. Burroughs did, in that it seems 
like it could mean something other than it was. On the surface, they seemed really simple, but the minute I saw them, I knew that they were more than that. From the beginning, he was my favorite artist, even before I met him. And the reference to Burroughs is that he's a beatnik um, writer, and similar to Jack Kerouac. Together, Andy and John Michel created large paintings, generally painting over each other's work to produce collages that represented their oppositional styles. Um, although highly competitive, Jean-Michel held some bitterness towards Andy for the collection's unfavorable reviews sometimes, and he grew distant at some times because of this growing paranoia that people might view him as sort of Andy's mascot. Um, from 1981 onward, Keith's career gained a lot of momentum, starting with a solo show in New York, which led to international exhibitions, public murals, design collaborations, and an animated billboard in Times Square. Already established as a high-demand artist, Keith was constantly producing more work. As you'll see, that's the common thread between all of these artists, is that they're workaholics. They're constantly producing more work and reinventing themselves with the intention of making art easily available to the public, which really is piggybacking on 1960s pop art. Pop art stands for popular art. And what Andy Warhol did, in 1960 was take everyday objects, like for instance, Brillo pads or Campbell soup cans, taking them from the lowest of the low, which was inexpensive public supermarkets where they had canned soup and Brillo pads for suburban housewives and painting them on canvas, making them highly visible.